So I'd like to welcome everyone. I am Professor Dudek. I am the chair of the political science department. And this is uh, another talk in the series of political science talks politics. And this was something that we started as part of the 2020 election cycle. And we realized that we have these amazing experts here on campus and we decided, you know, we should take advantage of them. And we are at a really interesting moment. Is it exactly 100 days? Where are we at 100 days in the Biden administration? We're, this is day 65. We're at day 65. We're approaching that 100 day mark, which is usually marked in uh, an American presidency. And we're so fortunate to have with us Professor Mina Bose, who is the executive dean for public policy and public service uh, program at Hofstra University. She's also the Peter S. Calico Chair in Presidential Studies, and she's also the director for the Peter S. Calico Center for the Study of the American Presidency. She has authored and co-authored several books and articles on the American presidency, as well as American politics more generally. So I can't think of a better person to talk to us today um, to analyze the Biden administration as we're moving into that 100 day mark. And of course, there is his very first um, press conference today. So this comes at a really wonderful time. So without further ado, I would like to present Professor Mina Bose and to thank her so much for sharing her knowledge with us today. So I will give the floor to you. And what I'm going to ask all of you to do during the talk, I would like the, the chat is going to be turned off. And then once the talk is over, we'll open up the chat and we'll have some uh, question and answer. And I'll moderate that question and answer session following the formal talk. So I will hand this over to you, Professor Bose. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dudek. And let me just say uh, thanks to Dr. Dudek and to political science um, for developing this lecture series. The Poli Sci Talks Politics has been so instructive. Uh, we started in fall 19, and um, I think we've been doing two to three talks a semester. And so I've enjoyed listening to my colleagues, and I'm so excited to be delivering this one today. Now, um, let me just say the title of my talk, which I developed, which I put this together, I think, in the winter. What are the keys to leadership in the Biden presidency? 2021 vision, White House organization, and agenda resetting. Now I have to tell you, I have too much to talk about today. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I keep trying to, I kept trying to condense my points this week, and we're not even at the 100 day mark, which actually, um, we'll have the third Poli Sci Talks Politics lecture on the Calico School poll, which Dr. Craig Burnett and I will be discussing on Thursday, April 29th, which is the 99th day of the Biden presidency. So we're getting it right in before the uh, 100th day mark. So I'm kind of thinking that what I can't finish up today will continue in, <laughs> in another 35 days. But there is presidency studies as a field has been so active for the past few years. And particularly in the past few months, as we look at a new administration um, facing a once in a century crisis, we're starting to see signs of improvement, many challenges connected to the pandemic um, that have to be addressed in the coming uh, weeks and months, and much more kind of, and also longer term underlying uh, issues that haven't been addressed in American politics for some time, and of course, concern for unexpected crises, particularly in foreign policy. We're also seeing it um, currently in American politics, um, the uh, challenges in immigration right now, um, and the fact that the vice president has been asked to uh, head the um, task force to examine how to address the uh, the um, the challenge of incorporating how to uh, determine status um, 
um, and um, petitions for admission to the United States from so many people who are uh, making cases for asylum and other um, and other reasons for trying to enter uh, the United States. And so this is a very difficult time in presidency studies. Um, and then on top of that, uh, President Biden is giving his first press conference um, just after this talk ends at 1.15. They coordinated with us, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but it was a, certainly a very, uh, when I saw that for the past few weeks, if you've been following this, I know the students in my presidency class, we've been discussing this a lot. There's been some criticism of the president for taking so long to hold a news conference. Now, he's certainly had speeches, the town hall meeting, the March 11th address from uh, the White House. I'll talk about those shortly. But his actual first press conference, this is the 65th day. If you're hearing 64, it's the 64th full day of the Biden presidency, because of course, January 20th, his term started at noon. Um, so this is a little far of, of two months in, right? Almost uh, over two months before the first news conference. Just for some recent historical comparison, um, Presidents Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton had their first press conferences uh, about nine days in, so just after a week into office. Uh, uh, Barack Obama had one 20 days in. Donald Trump was 27 days. Um, and uh, and so and at the 50 day mark in the pre in recent presidencies, um, Trump had participated in five news conferences. Those weren't all solo. In fact, only one for each one. Trump had done five. Obama had done two. George W. Bush three and Bill Clinton five. Um, but those were each each one had only had a solo one single solo press conference. The others had been after meetings with foreign leaders. So. I think there's some reasons why President Biden has has waited, and we'll talk about that. Um, but it's not uh, completely uh, so. Biden's press conference, news conference, is later than uh, his recent predecessors. It certainly raises a question as to um, how often the Biden presidency, how often President Biden will choose to communicate with the press. Just for some longer historical uh, perspective, Calvin Coolidge uh, had 407 press conferences in just under about five, year, five, year, five and a half years in office. FDR had 881. Um, moving up, Lyndon Johnson was the last one to be in uh, three digits, um, if we don't include joint conferences. Uh, he had about 134. 100, just over 130. Um, more recently, Barack Obama did um, 65 uh, solo, a few part-time, and then numerous 95 joint conferences. And we've started to see an increase in that in recent years. But um, Clinton, George W. Bush, Donald Trump all held numerous joint conferences with other participants. But as far as solo conferences, uh, Obama had 65, Trump had 44, George W. Bush had 49, Clinton had 59. So um, are these important? Are they helpful? I'm going to say yes, uh, when I'm discussing the keys to leadership, I'll connect vision to communication. And I'll say more about that uh, shortly. And uh, also discuss, well, I'll actually start with organization, vision communication and agenda setting. I did want to offer, um, I was, uh, as I was finalizing my slides uh, yesterday, uh, I have two teenagers and one of them asked if uh, asked about PowerPoint, said, well, do you have any video? I said, no, I have pictures. She's, and my daughter said, well, that is so boring. No one is going to be interested. And I thought, well, I can certainly do better than that. So given that we're going to hear a press conference today and hopefully you'll have a chance to see it or uh, listen to it later or at least uh, read the transcript in my presidency class we will certainly be discussing it uh next week but i thought it'd be helpful to just see uh, a comparison kind of thinking about what press conferences how they've changed in the past half century uh president john f kennedy was the first president to hold live televised news conferences. Um, Kennedy, of course, is uh, known as a, is renowned for his communication skills. And I think it's interesting if you look back at his press conferences, is they were really, um, if you talk with people who saw them at the time, people look forward to seeing them in the afternoon. But substantively, they're very different 
from what we would expect today. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to try to just take a minute. Hopefully I can do this. I practiced it a few minutes ago. Uh, hopefully it'll still work. I'm going to share my screen and just show you about five minutes from a video uh, called Thank You, Mr. President. And it has highlights from Kennedy's press conferences. And I think you'll see why uh, we'll, we'll uh, say a few words uh, in uh, just a moment about how they've changed. So hold on, give me one second and let me see if I can make this work. Oh. I have uh, several announcements to make. Hey, first is one made at the request <laughs> of- uh, I saw. The election, the yep. burden of our son and the inauguration. This is Kenneth as Kennedy and I have received over 100,000 letters and telegrams oh. of congratulations and good wishes. They are now- building up in available rooms at the White House. Unfortunately, it's not going to be possible for us to acknowledge and answer as we would like to answer each and every message. And therefore, if I wish to take this opportunity on behalf of Mrs. Kennedy and myself to thank everyone who has been so kind and generous. Yes. Three months ago, a federal court in New Orleans ordered two public schools there desegregated. Since then, what is apparently an organized campaign of intimidation has kept most white children out of those schools and effectively frustrated the court order. As far as New Orleans goes, uh, it is uh, my position that all students uh, should be given the opportunity to attend public schools regardless of uh, their race, and that's in accordance with the Constitution. It is in accordance, in my opinion, with the judgment of the people of the United States, so there's no question about that. The broader question, of course, is, uh, regardless of the court decisions, I believe strongly that uh, every American should have an opportunity to uh, have a maximum development of his talent under the most beneficial circumstances. And uh, that is what the Constitution provides. That's what I strongly believe. Mr. President, uh, General Eisenhower uh, said the other night that uh, he thought the current administration, the present administration was spending too much money on defense. I think we're spending uh, a good deal of money on defense, and I don't, I don't enjoy it. But uh, on the other hand, I think we live in a very... Uh, dangerous world, and I believe that uh, being uh, strong uh, helps uh, maintain the peace. And uh, I must say, on the one hand, we seem to be under attack by uh, some Republicans for uh, not doing enough to stand up to uh, the communists, and the other by those who say we're spending too much on defense. I think there sh should be some coordination of policy, because it seems to me there seems otherwise it may appear that the grand old party may be floundering. <laughs> to Africa has been widely criticized for some of the statements he's made, that is, Mr. Williams, including the one of Africa for Africans from a lot of statement of Africa for the Africans does not seem to me to be a very uh, unreasonable uh, statement. He made it clear that he was talking about all those, all those who felt that they were Africans, whatever their color might be, whatever their race might be, and I don't know who else Africa should be for. <laughs> The uh, cure over the uh, Supreme Court's decision on uh, prayer in the schools, some members of Congress have been introducing legislation and constitutional amendments uh, specifically to sanction prayer or religious exercise in the schools. The uh, Supreme Court uh, has made its judgment. A good many people uh, obviously will disagree with it. Others will agree with it. <laughs> but I think that uh, it is uh, important for us, if we're going to maintain our constitutional principle, that we uh, support... Uh, Supreme Court decisions, even when we may not agree with them. In addition, we have in this case a very easy remedy, and that is to pray ourselves. And I would think that uh, it would be a welcome reminder to every American family that uh, we can uh, pray a good deal more at home, we can attend our churches with a good deal more uh, fidelity, and uh, we can make uh, the true meaning of prayer much more important in the lives of all of our children. That power is very much open to us. And I would hope that uh, as a result of this decision that uh, all American parents uh, will intensify their efforts at home. Uh, as a former member of the House of Representatives and the Senate, sir, how do you feel about uh, proposals to increase the size of the House from the present number 435? Well, as a former member of the House, I would uh, feel that it should be left to the members of the uh, House of Representatives. President, uh, yes. I'd like to ask you a two-part question. Uh, 
Do you think that Mr. Nixon should run for governor of California? And, and uh, as a politician, Mr. President, what do you think of the advisability of a political party giving a defeated candidate a second chance at the presidency? Well, I would think in answer to your first uh, question, if Mr. Nixon asked my view as a fellow uh, practitioner of the uh, follower of the political profession, I'd be glad to give him my opinion, as I do have an opinion on the matter. Uh, but uh, uh, the second, uh, the second uh, I think that, uh, that uh, history is filled with the uh, case of a uh, man who's been defeated for uh, offices, who've uh, continued their public service. And uh, I... Uh, I think we'll, uh, we've seen it very much in the last few years. I'm sure we'll see it in the next years. President. Yes, Mr. President, the Democratic platform in which you, you ran for election promises to work for equal rights for women, including equal pay, to wipe out job opportunity discriminations. Now, you have made efforts on behalf of others. What have you done for the women according to the promises of the platform? Well, I'm sure we haven't done enough, and, uh... <laughs> I must say, I am a, a strong believer in equal pay uh, for equal work, and uh, I think that uh, uh, we ought to uh, do better than we're doing, and I'm glad that you reminded me of it, Mr. President. Mr. President, okay. uh, Sorry. Congressman, Sorry. Alger, Texas, they criticized... Uh, Mr. Salinger, as a quote, young and inexperienced White House publicity um, man. Yeah. Okay. Sorry that took a little longer. In, if we were in person, I'd be able to uh, close it and start it. But I wanted you to see those examples. Um, I think that's a pretty much a clear illustration of what we won't see today. <laughs> in the Biden press conference. And that last question from May Craig, um, as we're in Women's History Month, I think it's important to recognize um, just how easy it was uh, 60 years ago for a president to deflect substantive questions and um, the kind of camaraderie that was in place there. Um, in the, and those are, those are excerpts that, that wasn't all from one press conference. Those are compilations. If you're interested in seeing more of Kennedy's press conferences, you could actually find them at the Kennedy Library on the Kennedy Library website. Um, but political scientist Martha Kumar, who has written extensively about White House communications, um, was quoted in an article recently as saying that press conferences are a place where presidents establish the legitimacy of their ideas and call for public support. Well. That's, I think, what we're going to see today. That wasn't the case. That's very much how press conferences operate or what the expectations have been, I would say, for at least the last two decades. They're probably dated back a little more to the 80s or so when we started in the 90s when we start to see real kind of contentiousness between the president and the press. And it was there in the it was there in the 70s. And Kennedy faced it as well, but nowhere near to the um, same degree do we see the uh, the pressure on presidents. And I think particularly that we're going to see for Biden today. So let me tie this in. How does this tie into my talk about the keys to leadership? Well, the the underlying argument that I'm making here today is that if we apply presidential studies, what can the field of the American presidency apply to uh, America, to current politics? And it's that presidential leadership qualities do matter for governance, communication, vision, organization, uh, political skill, and other qualities. And that the political system, broadly speaking, can be directed, and that may be a little overly ambitious, in, uh, particularly in the 21st century, in an era of hyperpolarization um, and uh, const uh, constraints, um, both politically, economically, but guided, if not directed, um, that the political American political system can be guided or influenced by executive leadership. And furthermore, right, the reason why um, I wanted to give this talk early in an administration, right? And I we scheduled this before we knew whether it would be a new presidency or second term, but regardless, early in a presidency, um, 
political scientists have found that the quality of early presidential leadership matters for success in governance and defining success, broadly speaking here, as progress on policy priorities. Now, how do we measure presidential leadership? That is a tricky question. What I'm going to do, uh, what I'd like to do in this talk, and I've already taken more time than I meant, but I wanted to just kind of provide a contrast of just to see how the presidency has evolved even within the modern era, um, not just Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but some uh, 20 years after FDR's presidency up to the present. What I'd like to focus on today is, um, are three areas of presidential leadership. The first is the transition period. And um, I won't spend as much time on this as I had initially planned, but there is extensive political science research that argues that um, a stable transition period establishes a foundation for hitting the ground running. And um, that includes executive appointment nominations and confirmations, meetings with the, uh, if, if it's a new presidency, as in this case with Biden, meetings with the outgoing administration, structured agenda setting. Second, presidential public communications, speeches, and news conferences are indicators of policy priorities and vision. And the clear vision matters for the direction of the administration. And I should say, and I'll get to this more in a moment, that vision means more than setting priorities. It is, um, it's an indication, but vision as political scientists describe it is really a connection between underlying goals of an administration and a clear, I don't know if I would say enunciation, but at least a clarity in the for the president and the president's advisory team on the means to achieve those ends. And so I'll talk more about that shortly. Um, and then finally, uh, of course, and maybe this is uh, what people really want to talk about, is uh, our policymaking actions. Um, that agenda setting involves uh, putting into place campaign promises, um, adjusting to uh, recognize the political opportunities or restrictions. Uh, of course, when uh, Joe Biden was elected, it wasn't clear whether there would be unified or divided government or semi-unified uh, government. As it turns out, unified government, narrow democratic majority in the House, uh, Vice President Harris's tie-breaking vote in the Senate brings opportunities that semi-divided government would, um, would restrict. A lot of times, if you look at articles about the presidency and political some presidential scholars are interviewed, they're asked to grade presidents. And you'll see, if you, if you go through and look, you can just Google Biden grading his presidency or something like that. Um, a lot of kind of B, B plus grades. Well, of course, it's very hard. I think uh, presidents could do very poorly. Um, thinking about uh, Bill Clinton in 1993, I think it was in June of 93, Time Magazine published a title page article called The Incredible Shrinking President, uh, a lot of the disarray in the early Clinton administration. It's easy to make mistakes. It's very difficult for a president to have the 100 days that uh, was referred to at the beginning uh, that FDR had. And of course, that was prompted in large part by um, really devastating economic conditions that, uh, that we don't want to see again. So. I would say that um, when we look at early leadership, when we look at Biden's leadership, we do see early success in governance. And I think, a, you know, a I, I really don't like doing great, so I'll resist that, but I would say it's a solid, if, if I were giving a midterm progress report, right? Biden is, is, has a solid start. Now, let me offer a few uh, caveats there, because I know that's not a lot of a thesis statement. Governing in crisis times, which I would say the pandemic falls under that, brings more unity, particularly within a political party. And I think we've seen uh, the Democratic Party in Congress has been unified till now. Um, will that hold for non-crisis issues now that we've moved past the American Rescue Plan, right? And we see a number of other issues coming up ahead, immigration, voting rights, infrastructure, Foreign policy and foreign policy is a large topic, right? I could do a separate uh, talk on that, or we, we've had those. Um, how do we balance attention to process with the need for results and the fact that a president's window of opportunity is very small? 
before I would say Washington institutions shift their focus to the midterm elections as do uh, as does the public. And that will is typically seen as 12 to 18 months after the start of a presidency. So the window, a four year term suddenly becomes even narrower as far as an opportunity to get things done. Finally, how do we address long term US interests with a nar this narrow window of opportunity? for strategic governance and thinking about issues such as uh, what US policy should be in Afghanistan as President Biden weighs whether to keep a minimal troop presence there after the May 1 withdrawal date that was negotiated in the Trump administration. So I'm gonna to try to talk a little bit about each of those issues. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now and I'll try to keep this um, to about 25 to 30 minutes um, so that we can at least have, um, at the very least, 25 minutes for questions. So I'm going to actually move through some of my slides a little more quickly than I planned. Um, sorry, hold on one second. What you're seeing is not what I am seeing, and I need to move this. <laughs> OK. Um, Some reason my slides are not ah there they go no the slides are Dr. Dick are the slides showing they're not right we can, we can see the slides it's not in the uh, slideshow view but we can see them that's so okay if you um, have your lap are you using a laptop and a separate screen. I am, but um, you would have to close the laptop if your camera is on a separate thing. The That's... camera's on my laptop, so I have. To... Okay, then you can't close it then. Yeah, That's the one challenge I've had with Zoom. If you're using separate screens, it it doesn't um, play nicely. Hold on one second. But I've been doing this in class. All right, sorry for the technological thing. Let me just see. Okay, so now I'm pressing my slides. That's not no. Um, we can see the slides themselves. It's just not in um, slideshow mode, if that matters. Do yeah, you know? no, it's you just can um, read them. Okay. Um, oh, you know what? Uh, all right. I, I, well, I'll keep going. I'm not going to delay this. Um, I'm just hoping that I could just see why, because I can't see what you're seeing, which is a little, which I've never had before. Okay, now everything's gone. Oh. Okay. Are they back there? Now we're good. That's good. Oh, now it's gone. It's okay. Leave it like this because we can see them. We see like the whole screen. It's not in slideshow mode. Um, but we can see the slides. All right. You know what? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just going to try it one last time to see if I can get this to work because I would, because if I can't see them, then I can't move through what I'm doing as quickly. So let me just, I'm going to, Try it one last time, everybody. And if it doesn't work, then I'll just go ahead with as they are. Okay. All right. So now that's open. Share the screen. Ah, oh, yes. Okay. Third time's the charm. Um, okay. So let me um, move ahead here then to uh, discussing some of the keys to leadership that I have presented. Okay, thanks everybody. So like I said, I'm. Uh, if we start with the importance of hitting the ground running, allow me to just kind of give a little bit of the political science background here, right? And um, drawing this, uh, the importance of early governance from uh, political scientist, Jim Fifner, George Mason University, who's published numerous books on the presidency, one of the kind of foundational texts is uh, his work, The Strategic Presidency, which uh, was published in the late 80s, then a second edition in 96. I actually used this in my uh, dissertation, which became my first book. Uh, Fifner writes that only the authority of the presidency is transferred on January 20th. The power of the presidency in terms of effective control of the policy agenda must be consciously developed. By strategic presidency is meant a self-conscious approach to planning the assumption of governmental control after an election. 
Fifth girl goes on to say, and students in my presidency class will be familiar with this as the seventh paradox from the Cronin textbook, campaigning is not the same as governing and people well suited to one are not necessarily good at the other. The cycle of decreasing influence is in direct conflict with the cycle of increasing effectiveness. So on the one hand, presidents have, uh, especially new presidents, even if they've served for eight years as vice president, have just come completed a camp presidential campaign that has been 18 months or more. When you think the first 2020 presidential campaign primary debates were in June of 2019, and suddenly there's a shift to governance in a very abbreviated short transition period. As presidents learn on the job, as they have increasing effective effectiveness, they have decreasing influence due to our structure of fixed elections. And again, Fifner, quoting from Fifner, the president's greatest opportunity to work his will right, comes when he has the least ability to do it effectively, right? Note that he's saying he in the 1990s, uh, uh, change that uh, today. This is what makes planning an effective transition so crucial. And what does Fifner mean? Says that when presidents are, as they are coming into office, despite their whatever expertise they may bring from executive governance, legislative expertise outside the political world, um, they are still learning the presidency is a position like no other. And the need for action early in a presidency takes place when the president has the least information about success and failure. And this is why the transition is important. One could argue this is where Biden's eight years as vice president have been so influential. Keep in mind also that the presidential transition period is highly condensed due to the 20th Amendment. Um, and you know, there's some interesting historical information here. Um, why did the why does the United States have elections on the on Tuesdays? Well, in the 19th century, that was because of the agrarian society that we were in, um, and the need for traveling for voting. Uh, people needed to travel to vote. Uh, that meant a two day window. They couldn't vote on the weekends because uh, many uh, Americans went to church on Sundays and Wednesdays was market day. So um, this is why a Tuesday turned out to be the best day for elections. Um, why were they in November? Well, that was post harvest and before the harsh winters began. Spring and early summer had interfered with planting season and early fall interfered with the harvest. Um, this certainly raises some questions about whether uh, you know, some of the, the tradition, the uh, what we practices that we have in place are really due to variables that factors that are not so significant anymore. Um, the 20th Amendment was ratified by 48 states within a year in 1933. FDR was the last president to be inaugurated on March 4th for his first term. His second term in 1937, uh, his inauguration day was January 20th. If the purpose of this was to limit the lame duck period for presidents, for the uh, for a uh, president who was leaving office. Um, after the 20th Amendment, the Presidential Transition Act of 1963 was passed um, to minimize, this is quotation, disruptions uh, for the transfer of executive power. Um, the goal behind the legislation was that recognizing that time, not money, is a precious resource in an administration. And um, that's why Congress allowed the general services administrator to decide who was the successful candidate would be before the electoral college officially meets. I'm actually quoting from testimony there from a political scientist, Paul Light, uh, before Congress in 2000, when the electoral college vote result was in question. Since the late 1990s, political scientists have been very active in working to provide nonpartisan advice on presidential transitions. The White House Transition Project, which was created by Professor Kumar, whom I quoted earlier, um, has played a, a significant role in providing guidance to, um, to the victors in presidential elections. Um, without partisanship. And I had a series of uh, photos I was going to show you of kind of uh, transitions that even if they've been uh, contentious behind the scenes, I'm thinking 
Harry Truman and Dwight D. Eisenhower, who, although um, in the 19, it, when Truman came into office, were on very collegial terms. By the time the morning of Washington, of Eisenhower's inauguration, their relationship was so, uh, was so uh, had become so chilled that Eisenhower refused to go into the White House for a cup of coffee before the inauguration. But you wouldn't guess that from this image of them leaving for the inauguration. In 2000, it was a highly abbreviated transition due to the um, the question about the vote count in Florida. When in fact, um, George W. Bush was, uh, after the Supreme Court ruled and the Florida votes were, uh, electoral college votes were decided in Bush's, George W. Bush's favor, um, President Clinton immediately invited him to the White House. I thought this was a nice photo to show you. This is in the final days of the Bush 43 administration. Um, President, uh, then President elect Obama is there and Bush has invited, of course, his father, Bush 41, former President Clinton and former President Carter. Flash forward, and this is two days after the election in 2016, um, President Obama Obama invites President-elect Trump to the White House. And you can see there's certainly uh, not the friendly relationship we see here, but nevertheless, a meeting in the White House. We do have some images since then. And I'm just gonna show these two that I'm making it, I wanna make a connection here to kind of preparation for governance. This photo is from uh, March of 2018 at the funeral of Barbara Bush. And uh, the photographer actually just saw an opportunity. The former presidents were present. Uh, then First Lady Melania Trump was there and uh, got this picture of everyone uh, together. Uh, at the end of that year, at the funeral of uh, President Bush 41, this is the one image that I've found of um, Presidents Carter, uh, Clinton, Bush, Obama, and Trump together in one place. As we've seen, as we know, of course, um, President Trump did not, former President Trump did not attend the inauguration for, um, for uh, President Biden. Um, given the January 6th attack on Capitol Hill um, and the contentiousness of the election results, uh, the, uh, it probably was a good call. Um, I think that was probably uh, one area where there was some agreement on both sides. However, um, what this indicates, and I'm showing these images to uh, just point out that there are consequences to a contentious transition period and that they uh, it, it loses, it creates, limits the opportunity for an incoming administration to hit the ground running. It further uh, the kind of the narrow window of opportunity for a president elect to prepare to govern is shortened even further. That said, if we look at appointments in the Biden administration um, as of this week, um, administration is doing pretty well. And if you're interested in specifics on cabinet secretaries, um, Politico has a great website. The Washington Post tracks this, the Brookings Institution. Um, as of this week, um, all of the, um, all of Biden's cabinet secretaries have been confirmed. Um, in uh, Trump and Obama actually needed a little longer. So Biden has moved a little bit ahead. Um, there's been one nomination that was withdrawn that was near a tandem for OMB director. And, um, uh, but apart from that, when we look at there are additional positions with cabinet rank, such as the director of national intelligence, the chief of staff, uh, Ron Klain, who doesn't require Senate confirmation, um, the um, 21 Senate cabinet, uh, cabinet confirmations have in place. And there are more deputy uh, confirmations as well. So the Biden administration is on pace with their appointments. As far as organization of the Biden White House, what do we know so far? We know that um, President Biden keeps to a pretty structured schedule. Um, there are three gatekeepers to access to the president, the chief of staff, Ron Klain, um, director of Oval Office Operations is Annie Tomasini, and then uh, Tomasini's deputy, Ashley Williams. Um, 
At the same time, while uh, President Biden appears to focus on structure, predictability, uh, measured uh, time on events, spending a lot of a kind of uh, focus on uh, policy memos, obviously a lot of virtual uh, meetings. Biden is also, the article that I cite here by Anita Kumar in Politico, talks about how Biden is also has a kind of casual approach within the White House, kind of trying to drop in on meetings when possible, um, getting to spend time with staff members, visiting staff in the White House as permissible within COVID restraints, but for the most part, keeping a very um, structured, predictable White House. And the executive director of the White House transition project. Recently, Terry Sullivan, a political scientist at the University of North Carolina, said this is returning to the normal use of a president's time. Um, and what I would say for this, I'm actually running a little short here, so I'm going to move quickly past this in a moment. Um, political scientist Fred Greenstein, who's my dissertation advisor, has written about the importance of a president's cognitive style and organizational capacity. And we see Biden managing this well, taking in information, creating structure in the White House, and seems to be, as far as organization, navigating the paradoxes in the presidency that we know of how you balance nonpartisanship with political leadership, demonstrating compassion and tough decision making, projecting confidence, learning from mistakes. We see this in Biden's selection of um, cabinet appointees and top level officials. And if you're interested, I won't dwell any longer on this, but um, there's a nice image of, um, uh, this is from the Associated Press. Um, this was uh, by, uh, reflecting uh, the Biden transition office, um, how he wanted his administration to reflect America's racial and ethnic uh, diversity, choices for top posts. As I've said, the only person here who has not, um, uh, whose nomination has failed was uh, Neera Tandems. Um, okay, so I wanted to move into communication. Um, we're running a little bit short on time. So I think what I'm going to do is I will um, skip the uh, an extensive discussion of the inaugural address and just say that um, you know, Biden is doing well with appointments and organization. How is he doing with vision and communication? Well, his inaugural address was fairly consistent with his leadership style. Structured, predictable, low key. Um, are there memorable lines? What stands out? I kind of put a few excerpts in here. Uh, the struggle between um, our ideals of equality and the reality of, uh, of the long path, right? That is, uh, has been hindered through racism, nativism, fear, and demonization from achieving our goal. Um, a focus on optimism, right, through the Civil War, the Great Depression, World War, 9-11, through struggle, sacrifice, and setbacks, our better angels have always prevailed. The focus on the way of unity, saying, um, if you didn't support us, hear me out. If you still disagree, that's democracy. I pledge to you this, I will be a president for all Americans. I will fight as hard for those who did not support me as for those who did. What does that mean in policymaking? We'll discuss shortly. Um, I think that the, the President Biden's inaugural address is very sincere, very clear. Uh, I think there's a fair question as to whether a soaring inaugural address, it doesn't necessarily hit the highs of a John F. Kennedy's inaugural address, uh, Ronald Reagan stands out, um, you know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's first inaugural address in 1933. Not sure if the if that kind of eloquence is possible anymore. As I think back to um, President Obama, who really um, became president, at, le at least uh, became a viable presidential candidate because of communication. I'm not sure that any of his speeches as president Maybe the one in South Carolina after the um, the, the tragic sh shooting in uh, Charleston in 2015. Um, the, but I don't see Obama's speeches standing out as president as well as they did as they did during the 2008 campaign. Nevertheless, I think that when we look at Biden's messages and moving past the inaugural address to uh, the White House address on March 11th right, which was the day he signed the American Rescue Plan. So we start to see progress on the policy agenda. Um, very clear cut, 
communications, right? The war fitting, footing to implement vaccine distribution and use, um, talking about unity to move us forward, um, talking about, uh, again, devoting our resources and um, working together. Um, now, again, what does unity mean in practice? I'm going to come to that in a moment. You certainly see it here. I think the fact that President Biden chose to give this speech each in uh, the state uh, state room, the flags behind him, the American flag, the presidential flag, the flags behind him, instead of from the Oval Office, that this is um, uh, that we are moving out of the crisis uh, was significant. Now, how do we do that in practice? What does the Biden administration have to do? Well, I have to tell you, I put together um, a list. I was determined to kind of list ten policy issues. And I must tell you that this morning I was still reworking um, what to highlight here about where the administration is setting policy and where it is resetting. Um, and that is due to the events, the tragedies, the uh, horrific shootings in Boulder and in Atlanta in the past week. Again, the crisis with immigration and people seeking asylum in the United States the bill on voting reform um, that uh, is under debate in the Senate, um, questions about the Biden administration's plans for proposing a new uh, legislation on infrastructure, racial justice, uh, combating inequity and climate change, uh, foreign policy, I think is going to get <laughs> very little attention in um, in today's talk, though um, uh, it certainly merits our attention from Syria to uh, the recent meeting with Chinese leaders from Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, um, questions about what uh, happens in Afghanistan, and many other issues. Reopening schools. Uh, Biden administration's pledge to uh, to move forward by the hundredth day, making significant progress, and I think we're seeing this locally around Hofstra as well as around the country. What are the obstacles, or what are the opportunities and the obstacles for um, for agenda setting and policy making? Well, as I've said, um, unified government has very narrow margins. The CARES Act, um, in just for comparison, in 2020, um, when the COVID crisis uh, pandemic um, began, um, or was identified as such, um, the CARES Act passed unanimously in the Senate and nearly unanimously on a voice vote in the House. A year later, the American Rescue Plan uh, required Vice President Kamala Harris's tie-breaking vote in the Senate. And uh, almost entirely a party line vote in the House. In fact, one Democrat voted against the legislation. Um, what does this suggest? Is this Does this reflect ideological divisions in American politics? Are these more fundamental attitudinal divisions? This is kind of a healthy debate in political science right now. Um, scholars discussing, debating whether people, well, there are debates about whether elites are more divided than the, the general public. People who would argue that those divisions, ideological divisions go from the uh, national government down to uh, uh, public opinion more broadly, questions about whether those debates are on policy or more fundamental disagreements. What does this mean as far as opportunities for taking action? Well, we know from the first day of the Biden presidency on January 20th, executive actions are a tool for moving forward. Um, a high number of orders, proclamations, memoranda to uh, reverse decisions of the Trump administration and to indicate paths forward from climate change to um, racial justice, uh, removing uh, the travel ban um, that uh, the Trump administration had imposed and numerous other areas. This is one way for the Biden administration to take action. Questions about procedural reforms, the Senate filibuster, open topic for debate. I'm not going to go into a lot of the specifics, but glad to discuss those. Uh, questions about bringing back earmarks as a way of achieving bipartisanship. Again, um, when I was uh, discussing but President Biden has pledged unity, does unity mean bipartisanship? And if so, what is the where? Are there opportunities for bipartisanship? 
when we look at these topics, it's difficult to see. And particularly given the era of hyperpartisanship, which broadly defined as when kind of partisanship is viewed um, in kind of negative terms, right? That it's it's one party against the other, and the prospects for reform are just too limited or too narrow. Um, could Biden have passed a narrower American rescue plan? Yes, possibly, right? With the 10 Republican senators that he met with, um, probably at serious cost to promises within his own party. And so does the president try to achieve inter-party unity at the sacrifice of intra-party unity? Not an easy question. Um, as I said, I gave the president pretty high marks on organization. I think communication, very solid. Agenda setting, as far as following through and taking actions, um, I think the president's focus is unity as far as um, engagement but not necessarily uh, requiring bipartisanship for policymaking. How might bipartisanship, what are some possibilities? Earmarks has been one. Just, I wanted to mention a couple of uh, ref other reforms that have been raised. I, I really wanna make sure I have time for questions. So I'm, I'm kind of moving quickly here now, but there was an op-ed recently that was proposed that said um, that the president should, the ambassadorship should be fewer political appointments, more appointments based on career foreign service officers. And that would be a way of um, getting politics out of presidential leadership. Uh, political scientists, um, uh, Stephen Skoranek, John Dearborn, and others published an op-ed in the New York Times recently saying that Congress needs to be more assertive to balance presidential power, that there are ways ways to institute procedural reforms to keep the president from overreaching or from exercising too much power unilaterally as we see through executive actions. The final point I'm going to give, and I will say that this policymaking part of my talk is probably the most open-ended because there, there's such a strong debate about uh, presidential leadership, whether it should be bipartisan or whether strong party leadership is needed, um, whether procedural reforms are needed within Congress or whether there are more ways for Congress to assert itself without making rules changes. I'm just going to bring one last point up, which is that um, there was a study, and it's a couple of decades old now, but the scholars, um, their work continues to be cited because it, it's, I think, fairly important. Um, they published a book in the late 90s called Stealth Democracy. Um, and they the argument is that Participation in politics is low because people do not like politics in the best of circumstances. They simply do not like the process of openly arriving at a decision in the face of diverse opinions. Um, and so what I'm paraphrasing there, process matters. Um, political scientists who uh, presented this argument uh, basically said that Americans arguing against, um, said that people are maybe less inclined to be politically active than we think, but they want to know that the process is moving forward with clarity, some transparency, some accountability, that people are more, in some ways, are more concerned about process than policy. Um, there have been a number of political scientists who have question this argument. Uh, I'll leave I'll leave that to just say that um, I, the reason I bring this up here is that as we look at prospects for policy making and agenda agenda setting resetting in the Biden presidency, it's important to keep in mind what Biden is able to achieve and what what Biden can achieve and what the public what public constraints and opportunities may be. And um, this my, I, I think that the Hibbing and Thice Morse uh, analysis suggests that some more attention to process is desirable um, along the lines of kind of, uh, of, of bringing together coalitions, uh, ideological, political, to reach policy decisions. 
Whether that's possible or not, again, this is day one in the Biden presidency, uh, signing the executive orders and other actions. Uh, it's 65 days, just so you know. Biden's approval rating is about is above 50%, as it's been since the start of his presidency. Favorability is actually the same. Congress's job approval is under a third, 29%. It's been a lot lower before, so that's actually not bad. And 41% of the country thinks we're moving in the right direction. That's real clear politics as of, uh, I think I checked that earlier this morning. It seems like a long time ago. So to sum up, what does that mean for where the how the Biden presidency is doing? Well, I hate to give you know someone a limited and a somewhat unscientific answer, but I think pretty well, but time will tell. Um, the American Rescue Plan, as, uh, as much work as that took, um, in some ways was easy. And now some of the harder governance challenges are to follow. And I think we will see today in uh, President Biden's press conference, again, some of the uh, measured approach to communication um, and to laying out a vision, this kind of uh, bringing together of ends and means that I discussed earlier that we've seen in previous speeches. I think the same kind of attention to multiple considerations, constituencies that we saw with appointments um, and or White House organization, what that means for policymaking is really the um, on the many issues that I raised, and I'm sure others that uh, several of you would bring up as well, is really the key question. And um, I think some of the procedural changes that I mentioned will be important for the president and his administration to consider, along with these questions about public opinion in making those decisions. All right, I've talked, that was a long time. I'm sorry that went over a little longer, but like I said, there was a lot to discuss. So with that, it's actually 1245. So. <laughs> Perfect. That was a great note to end on, Professor Bose. I want to thank you so much for your presentation and uh, I'll be back in another hundred days. <laughs> <laughs>